Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're investigating if the Core i7-8700K really performs as advertised by your favourite media outlets. But before we get into it, today's video has been sponsored by Alliance Heroes of the Spire. Finally we have a respectable mobile RPG title. It has over 400 unique heroes that can combine in over 10,000 different ways. Now that's very cool. The two coolest game modes include fighting to the death against crazy giant bosses or battling real people or even your best friends in a PvP mode. And not to mention really massive battles between guilds, which are my favourite. I really could speak about this game for hours, but it's best you go check it out for yourselves. And now for the sweetest part. Download Alliance via the link in the video description to get a bonus of 50,000 gold and 50 gems right away. Go check it out, and thank you to Alliance for sponsoring this video. Alright, so before we get into the benchmarks and even explain what this video is all about, let's just do a bit of a recap here. So, Intel rushed out their 8th generation Coffee Lake series late last year, and it was basically a paper launch to try and steal some attention away from AMD's Ryzen processors, which were continuing to gain momentum. It was a pretty weak move as Intel didn't really have supply, just a single high-end chipset was released, and prices were well above the MSRP for pretty much all of 2017. However, according to some, that wasn't even the real issue. Rather, the issue was reviewers, and I'd say I'm included in this, so reviewers loved what the 8700K had to offer in terms of performance, and they were all like, the 8700K is the best gaming CPU, hands down, and if you want big frame rates, then there's no better choice. The issue some seemed to have with this was that our results were misleading, and they didn't represent what you, the consumer, were going to be seeing, despite there being zero evidence of these claims. Oh, and that's consumer for American viewers who think consumer sounds ridiculous. Right. Was I talking about again? Uh, yes, so the results were misleading. There were a few reasons for these claims. Uh, one was the multi-core enhancement option, which is basically, uh, it basically overclocks the CPU, let's say, and it's enabled by default on a number of motherboards. Some reviewers did get caught out by this. I was well aware of this feature though, so I decided to disable it, though you could certainly argue that since it is enabled by default on a number of motherboards, it's just a feature, but Let's not go down that rabbit hole for this video. Truth is, it's essentially overclocking as it pushes the CPU above the Intel spec, so I've always opted to disable it. So bullet dodge there with the red fanboys, maybe not with the blue variety, but you can't please everyone. You really just have to go with what makes sense to you. So MCE is disabled in all our tests, what next? The next accusation was that Intel's TDP ratings for their 8th gen core processors is rubbish as they can't hold their clock speeds at the specified ratings, at least under certain conditions. This all came about because Intel now only advertise the base clock frequency, that's the minimum frequency all cores will operate, as well as the single core turbo frequency, the maximum frequency a single core can achieve. They no longer specify the operating frequency when two or more cores are under load. So the 8700K, which has a base frequency of 3.7 GHz, might only operate that frequency if the motherboard's power delivery or cooling solution aren't up to the job. This is opposed to the 4.3 GHz all-core frequency most reviewers, such as myself, saw. So a 14% drop in frequency could obviously lead to a decent decline in performance. So what impacts turbo frequencies? Well, the answer is many things, but I'm just going to mention four of them here. First is the type of workload. This plays a key role as it often dictates how many cores are active, which then dictates power consumption, and that in turn influences the operating temperature. Second is the ability to remove the heat from the CPU core. This is impacted by the TDP rating of the CPU package and the heat sinking system applied to that package. Third is the supply and performance capability of the VRM. Fourth is the capability and design of the PCB used by the motherboard. Most of us have heard of examples of catastrophic overheating of PCBs due to penny pinching, manufacturing techniques such as too light on the copper or thin on the tracks, for example. If any of these four simple factors are not designed and implemented correctly, then the CPU will start to heat up and then self-regulate its frequency, and then of course head down towards the guaranteed base frequency. Because reviewers generally use high-end motherboards and elaborate cooling solutions, this isn't really an issue, as we essentially show a best-case scenario. But what if you want to buy a budget motherboard and a cheap cooler? How much performance can you expect to lose? Well, in the case of the 8700K, as I noted a moment ago, up to around 14% would be possible. 
It's more extreme with the lower 65 watt TDP model, such as the Core i7-8700. There you could drop by up to 26% from the 4.3 GHz all-core turbo frequency to the base frequency of just 3.2 GHz. It's a similar story with the Core i5-8400 as well. So how bad does the motherboard and cooler need to be for this to be an issue? Well, late last year, TechSite Computerbase reviewed the Medion Eraser X67015, a pre-built that's sold at Aldi supermarkets. They found that when compared to their Core i7-8700 test system, the Medion Eraser was 13% slower in Cinebench's R15 multi-threaded test, and that placed it behind the Ryzen 5 1600X. That particular pre-built uses the Intel box cooler that comes with the 8700, and we are talking about the non-K model here, of course. However, the real issue here I suspect is a completely rubbish motherboard, an OEM version made by none other than ECS. Now, I don't have many nice things to say about ECS motherboards, so let's skip over most of my opinion, and I'll just say that the quality of their products has always been highly questionable. So if you're gonna make the argument that Intel CPUs can't hold their turbo boost clock speeds under load, I wouldn't recommend making that argument with an ECS motherboard. That said, I personally don't care about representing pre-built performance. Uh, frankly, if they can't make a system that gets the most out of stock components, that's a problem with the builder and not the component maker. Still, I wanted to look into this issue using cheaper components than what we typically use, as opposed to a pre-built system made as cheaply as possible while still working to maximize margins. So I got a few different cheap Z370 motherboards, an Intel box cooler, a new budget cooler from Silverstone, and representing the high end, the new Corsair H150i Pro. For the CPU, I went with the 95 watt Core i7 8700K and I thought that would be very interesting to see how it got on with the 73 watt box cooler that comes with the non-K model. If Intel should be accused of anything, it's that their lock CPUs come with complete and utter garbage to cool them. Their box coolers have almost always been a joke, and the cooler that comes with their 65 watt TDP models is a complete joke, at least when paired with their expensive 6 core models. Moving on from coolers, most of the testing was done on the MSI Z370A Pro, but I also tried the Gigabyte Z370D3 and the ASUS Tough Z370 Plus Gaming. All three boards delivered the exact same results, and those results were in line with what I got from the MSI Z370 Godlike and Gigabyte Z370 Aorus Gaming 7, for example. So a view, a viewer of Harbour Unboxed and presumably other YouTube tech channels, as well as a reader of various tech sites, been misled by reviewers using 8th gen core processors on high-end Z370 motherboards with expensive $100 plus coolers? Well, let's go find out. Before we get to the benchmark results, it's important we talk about temperatures first. Using the H150i Pro, Corsair's latest and greatest all-in-one liquid cooler sporting a whopping great 360mm radiator, we saw temperatures peak at 79 degrees after 2.5 minutes of load, and here the operating frequency held at 4.3GHz. Then 15 seconds later, the frequency dropped down to 4.1GHz, and this allowed temperatures to drop down to 72 degrees. Then for the next 30 minutes, temperatures hovered between 72 and 74 degrees as the operating frequency jumped between 4.1 and 4.2 gigahertz. Then representing the budget air coolers is the rather unimpressive Silverstone AR02. This cooler saw the 8700K peak at 91 degrees at 4.3 gigahertz after about one and a half minutes. Then 10 minutes later, it dropped down to 4.1 gigahertz where the temps lowered to 77 degrees. For the next 30 minutes, the temperatures hovered between 73 and 82 degrees and 76 degrees was the average across the entire benchmark test and the operating frequency sat at four gigahertz. Then we have the Intel box cooler that comes with their 65 watt parts and is rated for a maximum of 73 watts of heat dissipation. With the box cooler, the 8700K peaked at 100 degrees after three and a half minutes. However, the peak 4.3 gigahertz frequency was hit after a minute and a half where temperatures were reported to be 87 degrees. Once hitting 87 degrees, the frequency dropped to 3.9 gigahertz, then 3.8 gigahertz, then 3.7 gigahertz, and finally 3.6 gigahertz, but temperatures continued to rise. That said though, 30 minutes later, the frequency was jumping between 3.7 and 3.8 gigahertz, while the temperature remained locked at 100 degrees. So using those frequencies as a rough guide, the Silverstone AR02 could result in a two to 5% reduction in performance, while the Intel box cooler could reduce performance by as much as 14%. That being the case, let's move on to see how things played out. I figured Cinebench R15 was a good place to start, and here we see less than a 1% reduction in the multi-threaded score when using the AR02, opposed to the H150 Pro. That's certainly within the margin of error. 
I should note this test was run exactly a dozen times back to back to allow the CPU to reach its typical operating temperature and I'm reporting the average result of those 12 runs. Then with the Intel box cooler we see a 3-5% to reduction in performance from the all-in-one liquid cooler. That's not a lot and it's certainly nothing like the potential 14% reduction I thought we might see. It's also worth noting that the single core performance was the same for all three configurations but that's not terribly surprising as CPU isn't generating that much heat here. Anyway, let's move on to a much longer test. This Blender workload takes the 8700K at least 51 minutes to complete, and for that entire period it's under 100% load. Again, we see virtually no difference in performance between the 8700K using the H150i Pro and the Argon AR02. The results are well within the margin of error. Using the Intel box cooler did increase the completion time by 6%, taking us from almost 52 minutes to 55 minutes. Not an earth shattering result with a woefully underpowered cooler, but we are at least seeing a real difference here. When testing with Corona, we once again see there's really no difference between the budget air cooler and Corsair's mighty H150i Pro. We do, however, see a 6% reduction in performance when using the flaky little Intel box cooler. The Povray render benchmark also shows no performance difference between the all-in-one liquid cooler and the budget air cooler. The Intel box cooler did cause performance to drop by 8% though. The 7-zip test was left looping for an hour, and here we see little to no difference between the three tested configurations. Here the box cooler reduced performance by just 1.5%, which is basically within the margin of error anyway. Now for some gaming benchmarks, and this is where things get a little interesting. Regardless of which cooler we use, the average frame rate was pretty much the same, and that was not something I was expecting to see, at least not with the Intel box cooler. However, we do see a 2% drop from the liquid cooler to the tower style air cooler for the minimum frame rate. Then we see an 8% reduction from the liquid cooler to the Intel box cooler, so that's a decent drop in performance. Next up we have F1 2017 and the built-in benchmark runs for just over 2 minutes and again we've taken an average of 3 runs here. We find a similar story to that of Battlefield 1, though this time the Intel box cooler does fall away a bit for the average frame rate. Here the average performance was down 2% while the minimum was down 4%. Those aren't exactly earth shattering margins though. Finally I tested Ashes of the Singularity and here we saw a 2% drop in the average frame rate when going from the H150i Pro to the Argon AR02. The minimum frame rate was also reduced by 3% and really this is within the margin of error. The AR02 did continually come in slower but at times the margins were just 1% or less. But based on an average of 3 runs this is the result we got. Then with the box cooler we see a drop of 6% for both the average and minimum frame rate. I believe what we're seeing here is a worst case scenario for gamers. Alright, so we've seen the results and it's pretty clear that anyone building their own desktop system isn't going to have any trouble getting the most out of an 8th gen core processor on an entry level Z370 motherboard with a cheap and nasty cooler. In fact, they don't even have to be that nasty. Deepcool are selling their Gamax 200T for just $8 on Newegg and Amazon. That's an insanely good deal. I'll provide links for you guys in the video description. Performance wise, it's very similar to the Silverstone AR02, uh, likely a bit better in fact. There are loads of budget alternatives such as the Cooler Master Hyper T2, the Zelman CN PS8X Optima, and the Cryorig M9 Mini Tower, just to name a few. That said, if you're spending over $300 US on a CPU, you're probably going to be prepared to spend at least $30 US on a cooler. But what about the locked processors that come with Intel's underwhelming box cooler? CPUs such as the Core i5-8400 for example. Well, that's not really a problem. Performance wise, you're not really sacrificing anything other than operating volume, and even then it's not that bad. These 65 watt parts also hit the expected boost clocks when using the box cooler. So what's all the fuss about then? Honestly, it's really hard to say. I guess the fact that Intel is no longer quoting the boost clock speeds for multi-core workloads led to a few wild conspiracy theories. For a CPU that can boost as high as 4GHz, the Core i5-8400 sure does have a low base clock frequency at just 2GHz, but the reason for this is perfectly understandable. All 6-core 65W TDP models will feature a low base clock and the reason for this is Advanced Vector Extensions, or AVX for short. AVX is a set of instructions for doing single instruction multiple data or SIMD operations. They built upon previous offerings such as MMX and SSE, and one way they did this was by expanding to 256-bit wide units from 128-bit. Both Intel and AMD support AVX instructions, 
But while Skylake, Kaby Lake, and Coffee Lake architectures offer two 256-bit wide units per core, AMD's Zen architecture only offers two 128-bit wide units per core. This means when running an intense AVX workload, the Intel CPUs are more power hungry as the wider data paths require more wires, and this leads to higher power usage, the upshot of course being much greater throughput. So if Intel wants to keep their new locked 6-core model such as the Core i5-8400 within the 65-watt envelope during AVX workloads, the clock speed has to be greatly reduced. In the case of the 8400, it needs to be dropped all the way down to 2.8GHz in order to remain within the thermal and power limits. This was less of an issue with the previous Core i5 generation as the Kaby Lake models only packed four cores and this meant the Core i5-7600 could guarantee a minimum operating frequency of 3.5 GHz with a turbo frequency of 4.1 GHz. So adding two extra cores means Intel's had to reduce the base clock speed by 20%, which seems reasonable if you want to keep the same 65 watt TDP without a die shrink. So that should explain why the new 65 watt 6 core Coffee Lake parts feature surprisingly low base clock frequencies. I also don't expect that we'll see anything different in terms of performance with the upcoming budget motherboards featuring the yet to be released H370 and B360 chipsets. Finally, there's no chip lottery when it comes to the advertised clock speeds and review samples proved to be no different to the retail chips. Some overclocked well and some didn't, but they all ran within an acceptable margin of the maximum single core turbo frequency. All testing in this video was conducted with retail chips and I've also tested three different Core i5-8400 chips, all of which held a 3.8 GHz all core turbo frequency during non-AVX workloads. And that's going to do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, then please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more content. And if you appreciate the testing we do here at Harbour Unbox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.